Well, hello there, everybody. Welcome to Away Games, a Chicago Cubs and baseball podcast hosted by two comedians who live in New York but love the Cubs anyway. Uh, I'm one of them. My name is Adam Mamawala. I'm here with Kevin McCaffrey. Kevin, I got to tell you, the vibes, pretty good. How you feeling? Uh, they're good. I watched uh, I watched the game last night from my uh, from my bed on mute as my wife slept. She works on a nice. radio show where she has to work up wake up very early in the morning to to get on to. And it was fun. I uh, the, as we're recording now, the last game that uh, that happened was Cubs versus Giants. And uh, there was, you know, the Cubs got behind early. Kyle Hendricks had some some tough luck, a rare error behind him by Cody. And then like the bloopiest of bloop hits behind him him mm-hmm. and you know and the Swanson error at that one point I forget if Hendricks was still in the game but I think yeah I think the Swanson error at least the one I'm thinking of came later but yeah when you get yeah. errors behind you in a game by Dansby Swanson and Cody Bellinger and then you still end up winning that's amazing and uh the point in the game that I felt like uh, specifically had me feeling the vibes you're talking about when Seiya Suzuki came up late they were down two and I just thought, I think he's tying it, which I tweet, I tweeted mm-hmm. and I almost felt like I had to qualify from at away games pod. This is not Adam tweeting it because usually that kind of optimism calling the shot <laughs> is more of a you move, I think. I do believe at one point I, I said I was going to go drive to Chicago and kiss David Bodie if he hit a home run, and, and he did do that. So. <laughs> he wanted he wanted a smooch. Um, so, yeah, I think leading into that and watching Saya tie it up, you know, I think we all have the, that experience watching our teams where sometimes you, you're you just bracing for the bad thing to happen. And mm-hmm. yesterday I was just sort of bracing for the good thing, even after they went down a few times. Yeah, and you know the thing, I was doing my, I actually went to the uh, Yankee game last night, and the vibes there, not as good. But, <laughs> no, um, way worse. Yeah, um, but I was doing my thing where I came home and had avoided the score, and I was kind of like, uh, you know, watching a, a fast-forwarded version of it. And, you know, Cubs give up, I think Hendricks gave up one run in each of the first three innings, and they're down 3 nothing. And the interesting thing is I had I had two f- feelings at that time. The first was... I think they're going to come back and win this game, which mm-hmm. is a nice way to feel when your team is down three nothing or down at all. Um, I don't think I would have felt that way earlier in the season. Um, but the other way that I felt, and and this kind of speaks to the Cincinnati experience over the weekend, is like which is the worst if, theme park, by the way. It oh is, yeah, even no, though they do, do have not, pretty good theme parks around there. But yeah. I, I think that's just the the creationist museum is is the Cincinnati experience. <laughs> hey, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, they got chili in there. They. Uh, I even had this feeling of calm of like, all right, well, if they do lose this game, it's going to be okay. Like I, I, I'm starting to feel that level of confidence about this group and and also their ability to bounce back. Um, and that's a really, a really nice feeling. And it's also cool to see them win a game 11 to eight yesterday where, yeah, you don't want to see the Cubs pitching staff give up, give up eight runs, but it's nice to know that this team can win that way because we mm-hmm. also had a lot of close wins and close losses towards the end of that Brewer series. Uh, and the beginning part of the Cincinnati series where it's like, yeah, you can't just expect to score two or three runs and win a bunch of games. And that's kind of how the Cubs ended up losing the the middle two is like, yeah, you can put it on the bullpen. But ultimately, I think we all know that the offense needs to be doing more. Yeah. And, you know, those were, like you said, after the, the two the two games that where you lost and, you know, probably two of the four or five most frustrating losses of the year when you're blowing yeah. games in the ninth. And when Edward Elzelay, who'd, you know, who had saved, I think, 18 opportunities in a row before he had to come in in the eighth and then being the guy with the bases loaded, still got out of it and I think got the win in that game. But still blowing the lead in back to back days against the Reds, a team that you're still in, you know, in pretty tight contention with really uh you know really sucked and but even though they're blowing in the ninth those are both games that are more on the bats because they they weren't putting up runs in a very mm-hmm. high run scoring ballpark against pitchers that were I, one guy i think just got called up from the minors to face that the other guy had been, uh abbott i think had had a really rough run lately but yeah yeah i mean the if you score two runs and then one run in cincinnati if, if that's the only information you have and you ask me or any reasonable person, do you win that game? I think you know that you lose probably 95% of those games. Oh, you would it think speaks you... To, yeah. yeah. It speaks you... to how fantastic uh, Javier Assad was. And that, that was really what, what sucked about the... Uh, I guess that was the the second part of the double doubleheader Friday night. Um, what, am I confusing it now? No, I'm sorry. Yeah, Friday was the bullpen game that... Quas started and all that, but mm-hmm. Saturday Javier Assad, I mean, just 
Brilliant. And he did get through a lot of trouble and, and kind of navigate his way through, uh, I would say, a, a good amount of situations where the Reds could have scored. But the point is, eight scoreless innings when you absolutely need it because the Cubs only scored that one run on the uh, Candelaria home run. Like, Assad has been as good as Stroman was when he was good. And I was that's yeah. incredible. I was just going to say that is the, exactly the comparison. The Cubs lost Stroman and got Stroman, actually, mm -hmm. in terms of how Javier Assad is filled in. Even we, I mean, uh, obviously, Assad's got a little more velocity, probably on average, than Stroman. There are two different physical types, obviously, but they're both guys who aren't huge strikeout guys. They get, they put the ball on the ground a lot. They pound the zone, mm -hmm. and it, so even not only the results, but also the way they get there is kind of a little similar and. Holy shit. I mean, you know, we've, uh, you know, I've poked fun at the idea, uh, as has pa uh, Patrick Mooney, I think, uh, of the Cubs being this sort of futuristic pitching development uh, gem of a lab and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still I, th I think it's clear they've they've improved in that way. Uh, but I think no better. There's no better example of it across the organization than Javier Assad, who was not a guy who was ever a, a top end signing or, you know, international signing or you know, a high draft pick or anything who I, has just come up and been great. And it seems, you know, I don't think you expect him to go through a full season with a two ERA, but I think now you, you look at Assad and you're like, this is a starting pitcher in the major leagues. This is right. and th like, even that is so far above what his projection was. I think mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, I think he's uh he's like the best development pitching story from, uh, from this organization, I think. Right. Yeah. And similarly, I mean, thinking about a scenario where I told you, hey, the Cubs are going to score two and one in Cincinnati. Do they win those games? If I told you, uh, you know, in, in April or March, hey, in September, Javier Assad and Jordan Wicks are going to be two of the five <laughs> Cubs starters. I would think that you probably would assume that that meant the Cubs had sold off and things have mm -hmm. gone horribly wrong. And the fact that these guys are doing this in the middle of a pennant race and, um, you know, even Jordan Wicks in his his second start, like probably not as great as the first start. It, it was he set a pretty high bar for himself, but um, to to give the team five innings and give up, I think, just the one run. Like, how, yeah, how are you not happy with that on his birthday, too? Yeah, copy paste it. Do it again today. I think he's pitched. Uh, Wix is going today is after today, yeah. after uh, we record this, and that's. Been, I, and I guess what both Wix starts have they been since we recorded last, or did we? Like, maybe we no, caught, no, because the first the first, the first one was in yeah. Pittsburgh, so I think that's we right. talked about that. Um, I want to say we recorded last week after the after the uh, the Brewer series. So, okay, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, you you how how do you not feel great about that? It looks great. He's you know he Wicks has been he's been missing bats too at a at a rate like I said I I didn't think was as much a part of his profile. But looking at the minor league stats, it's been you know he's 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 been showing that uh, that ability. And uh, just in terms of young pitchers too, there's a little news from today that uh, Luke Little just got mm -hmm. called up. Big a six, little news. A little news from a big man. It is uh, <laughs> Luke Little got called up, uh, and we assume he won't get the canario it seems like this guy is going to have to be used at at, at some point but he's going to make his debut he started the year in single eight south bend i believe and then shot all the way up he was a starting pitcher still at the beginning of this year but when you see a, a dude who's a six eight lefty with plus 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 velocity he hit 105 in college that's like a, that's a headline you see about him but he sits like 95 uh mm -hmm. mostly now very tough on lefties uh it seemed like he was always destined to sort of be uh be a reliever and he's he's an exciting call up um so he's gonna be in the mix i don't like that the cubs dfa'd uh shane green who they had stretched out yeah and I don't think they had to DFA anyone, unless I'm unless I'm missing something. I mean, I don't think they had to clear a forty man roster spot. I guess mm -hmm. just sending Green down, but and he never even got in a game after they called him up, right? I think he pitched one inning. He came in, he, he threw one inning. It was fine, and right. that was and that was it. Well, at uh, least uh, you know for immaculate grid purposes, that'll help some people out. But, that is uh, <laughs> well. No, yeah, I mean that's. Obviously, he's been in the major leagues before, but, uh, I, you know, you, you hear the phrase a cup of coffee. I feel like the Cubs just gave him like an, an empty coffee cup and then <laughs> sent him right. on his way. Yeah, exactly. Not even like a, uh, maybe the size of a tr true Italian espresso, but not like the power <laughs> that comes within that shot. I don't think I just I just simply I, I don't understand the thing Shane Green there when especially when you're a club that's so desperate for innings right now and really struggling right. to finish these things out. I, I, that I don't get. But. 
Uh, but little little's called up, so that's that's exciting to see. And as you said as, about Assad going eight innings, how about that Justin Steele eight inning uh, performance? I don't know how much of that you got to see. But. I yeah, I saw I saw the whole game, and uh, I, I feel like people still weirdly on a on a national level are not really thinking of him as the Cy Young, and I don't fully understand that. I don't know what else people are looking for. Like, I, I realize he may not win it, but how do you not have him in your top three if you're a national reporter? And I think this was really after that start, even though Steele's, you know, he made the all-star team. He is, uh, he has been sitting in the top 10 or top five in ERA the whole year, which again, maybe I'm uh, too old school, but to me, that is the, that is the thing I look at first because that tells me what you've done. That tells me not what you should have done or what the outside factors say, maybe right. probably could have happened. I like knowing what actually happened. And in that way, ERA still tells you a story and Steel's story in that way has been as, as good as basically anybody in baseball mm -hmm. all year. This really was the first week after that start that I think we started seeing like MLB, uh, like I think the MLB Twitter account did like a split uh, side by side with stats between him and San Diego's Blake Snell, who Snell's been striking out. Uh, he's struck out a, a decent amount more than than uh, than Steele has, but the ERA is just I think I think it's like two point five to two point five five. The innings are right equal with each other, even though Steele has uh, started three less games than Snell. So Snell, it's sort mm -hmm. of like the story of his ta the, when he won the Cy Young in Tampa, when he just went out and dominated for like five innings, six innings every time, right. you know, that's sort of a, a small example size. And to me, the Cy Young's a two-man story because I understand Spencer Strider is going to strike out, possibly could hit the 300 uh, <laughs> strikeout level, which is great. But Hate to be an ERA guy again, but it's like a full run plus worse than these guys. So I, 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 right. I'm just not interested. I like, I like guys who get outs and steal also when he needed it on a hot ass day against someone mm -hmm. who is in direct wild card contention struck out 12. So that was, uh, that was beautiful to see. It was like a whole, just a whole game full of new Justin Steele gifts is really what it amounted to. Yeah, they, right. He show, he popped the the sort of like mini Hulk Hogan flex, the the yeah. like forming the Omega with your uh, with mm -hmm. your arms a little bit. But then after the the last out in the eighth, I love that like he was just sort of like you could tell he used every ounce of energy he had. He was just done at that point yeah. and then walked it off. So, well, speaking of that, so there was uh, it's uh, easy to play the hindsight game, obviously, but there were some people saying like, oh, Javier Assad should have come out for the ninth inning. Do you ascribe to that? Because I feel like that's a little. It's a little unrealistic to expect that out of him. I think so too. I mean, I, 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 I'm not. I'm forgetting exactly what his pitch count was at. It was like a uh, hundred. Is that a hundred? I mean, I think I would have been fine with it either way. If you know, if he's that that locked in, I don't. I do think, you know, it's sometimes we can be we we can think there's like a magical thing about hitting pitch number one hundred. But mm -hmm. there, there isn't really there, you know, there's, I think there's a little wiggle room there. Um, but I think when Javier Assad gets you eight of those innings, I, I can't, I can't quibble with bringing in a reliever to try to get three outs because you've, you've gotten everything and more by a couple of innings worth than you could expect uh, from him. So yeah. I, I would have been fine seeing him go out with someone warming up in the pen in case he got in trouble, but I, I can't, I, I can't beef with that decision. Yeah. And it does. I mean, I think it's it's especially silly when people are trying to say like, oh, the Cubs lost games because Canario didn't play or because Shane Green didn't pitch. Like if you're if you're relying on the proverbial 27th man to be the difference in, in winning a game, then you haven't done enough to set yourself up to win it, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and maybe the, the plan with Shane Green was like, we just need bodies. So if there is a game that gets out of hand in either direction, he's going to be the guy to come in and pitch three or four innings. Mm -hmm. It just feels odd to me that they didn't utilize him more, uh, especially in that second game of the doubleheader on Friday. Um, yeah. And I'm not, I just don't really know what the plan was with him. And, and even with Canario to some degree, if other than like just being around the team, um, I'm a little surprised that we still haven't seen him utilized in some way. <laughs> Yeah, well, here's the thing with Canario. Alexander Canario, uh, he came over in the in the Chris Bryant trade with Caleb Killian. For people who don't know, absolutely destroyed it in the minors last year. Like upper, th I think like 38 homers, something like that. Stole a ton of bases too. Had a devastating injury at the beginning of the year. Came back. He got really hot for like a week. Hit a bunch mm -hmm. of bombs real quick, and then before he was called up, got really cold. 
and this is a guy with a high swing and miss profile. I think he's a little he's a little younger than uh, than Nelson Velasquez, our dearly departed friend, but a similar sort of bat profile. The Cubs called him up, and obviously he hasn't gotten into anything, even with uh, even with a doubleheader. And you know his family was there in Cincinnati yeah. watching him just sit down. And I think any player will tell you they'd rather be on the bench in the majors than on the field in the minors. Probably sure. you're getting paid better, all that. What I don't understand is if you're calling this guy up, like, there, I, I could see if they're like, we're not using this roster spot anyway. So for all the work he's done getting back this year, this is like a bit of a reward. Maybe if we need, you hmm. know, you get him up for a few days, especially since he was cold after coming back from a devastating injury. Like, OK, we don't want him playing anyway. Rest, but take your rest on the bench. I could see that on one hand, but on the other hand, when we've had David Ross and Jed Hoyer say, we're not getting people at bats now, this is only about winning, the Cubs aren't good enough to waste a roster spot on a gift like that right now. Yeah. Then that should be someone else. So I, so I don't, I'm not furious about it, because I, I don't think you, Canario has been the obvious better choice to hit instead of anybody mm -hmm. at this point. But I, I just don't think there's an explanation that makes enough sense for me right now. Yeah, it just it, it does feel odd. And you you would have thought that at least and the middle two games in Cincinnati would have been tough because of how close they were. And same goes with, uh, with Shane Green. But when you look at how out of hand the Sunday game got and then even um, I would say Monday to some degree, like the Cubs put up a, a good good score um, oh yeah i'm just surprised there hasn't been some opportunity for him to come in um for a, a pinch hitting <sighs> appearance just to like get get that out of yes. the way I, totally I a pinch hit in yeah. a blowout in the ninth that and right. th they had a chance to do that you know <clears throat> and that's one thing i really liked about joe madden's time as manager is when a guy would get called up he would start him immediately like he right. he thought that was a helpful thing to do to be like to make a player feel like they are part of the team and you don't mm -hmm. feel like a part of the team unless you get in a game really you know you feel like right. sort of an interloper so um yeah it's that's been a little weird even though between i know that's the canario thing has been what's getting the most buzz online uh but the shane green dfa and honestly annoys me more so i'm not <laughs> sweating it too much yeah um, so at this point, so the Cubs are right now two and a half back of the Brewers. By the way, the Cubs playoff percentage, I believe last week when we recorded, they were at like 64%. Mm -hmm. It's now, it's now 88%. Uh, um, okay. so take, take that to mean whatever you want it to. Yeah. So right now the Cubs are two and a half back of the Brewers who finally have lost a couple games here and there. Oh, that's and nice of them. In the, yeah, it is very nice of them. And then in the wild card, um, Cubs are only a game and a half back of the Phillies, but more importantly, they are a full three games up for a wild card spot in general. Mm -hmm. they're, they're three games ahead of the Reds, who the Cubs helped keep alive. And then the Marlins, surprisingly, who I think everybody thought were, were out of it again, mm -hmm. have won five in a row. And now they find themselves only half a game out of the final wild card spot. Diamondbacks are half a game behind them. And then the Giants, who the Cubs have beaten the last two days, uh, are now only a game under 500. And they're two games out of the final spot. So how are you feeling about all that? I, I think, honestly, at this point, I'm like, of course, the division is preferred always, but even if the Cubs could somehow get their way into the top wild card spot, just to be in a position where you get the three home games, yeah. um, I think would be huge. And, and at a certain point, I don't really care if it's the division or the top wild card spot. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I mean, I would very much I, like I would very much enjoy the division because to me, <laughs> this is this is not the uh, I don't know, this is a bit, bit more of an emotional fans call, I guess. But getting to celebrate on field and in the clubhouse a division title to me is right. is leagues better than getting to go. We're we're one of the best seconds or thirds, you know. Yeah. And uh, but playoffs will happen. I understand you're in the dance e either way, whatever. But I I still want that division, mm -hmm. and also I just like really enjoy Milwaukee not winning things. So that would be that would be cool to see. But yeah, I mean, it would take. I don't know if collapse is too big a word but it would take some like uh like a loose bit of structural <laughs> integrity you know like a there would have to be a minor crash to not make the playoffs at this point mm -hmm. i think just with all the pile up behind uh, the cubs in the good position they've they've put themselves in now um yeah so i mean i'm just like at this point i'm just fully expecting to get get three you know get two or three playoff games in there 
Yeah, and I, I still there's enough baseball left to be played that, um, and and even given the success we've seen in uh, in the past, you know, five to ten years as Cubs fans, I think there's still always that part of us as fans of this team that's like, I'm not going to assume anything until it's official. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm not I'm not cocky enough to think that there's no way that anything can can change in terms of the sure. Cubs uh, making the playoffs. But yeah, it's. Um, I, the, the the other thing is it's 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 almost getting to the point where you're starting to think about what potential matchups could be, mm-hmm. and I don't know how you feel. I would love to not have to face the Phillies in the first round. So, if yeah. the Cubs could win a division, then you're probably there's a better chance that if you face that bottom uh, wild card seed that you're facing one of the Reds, Marlins, Diamondbacks, or Giants. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, I personally yeah, would, would rather face any of those teams than the Phillies. I would too. I, I think those are all significantly better matchups for the Cubs. Also, but also like this, looking at where what the wild card standings are right now is just shows like uh, how dumb I can be at predicting things. Sometimes it's funny. You got to make yourself right. predict things at the beginning of a year. Uh, a lot of people are like who make fun of people's predictions online. It's like, well, just show me yours, baby. Like, uh, show me where, where were <laughs> yours? You said nothing, right? Uh, <laughs> cue the Teddy Rose about man in the arena speech uh, but this is <laughs> this is like uh, right now there'd be three teams from the bad nl central that is to, crazy yeah. to make the 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 playoffs right now which is uh which is wild and uh yeah i would uh, this is could be a surely come back to bite me thing but yeah I'd, I'd much rather play the reds than the than the phillies or something in that first round well and again to play the uh what if i could have told you game imagine if i told you that there was a chance that three teams from the central would make the playoffs and the cardinals would not be one of them yeah the G- great call that it just the hitting the embarrassment for for that team even harder is uh, <laughs> is is pretty enjoyable yeah nick uh, Mar- by the way our local local chicago uh chicago boy made good nick martini obviously hit that crushing home run to tie the game against the cubs and then last night the reds uh he had a game tying uh pinch hit three run homer against the mariners to tie the game in the eighth inning and then the, the Reds ended up winning. So Martini's really, uh, ra- you know, raise a glass. Raise a glass to Mar- <laughs> Martini when it's closing time. This guy, yeah, he is, uh, he is Mr. Clutch. Uh, and, and speaking about Mr. Clutch is for us, I think we, we mentioned it at the end of last, last week's podcast, but to give it a moment here, uh, just to talk about how good Seiya Suzuki has, has been uh, since, yeah. since the three game, sit down you know it mm-hmm. makes me it makes me be like everyone should take a three game sit down because of how how good he has been since then uh evan altman of cubs insider at d evan altman on uh on twitter uh show this stat since since the little break suzuki's at a 202 weighted runs created plus which is 102 percent better than league average and i mean it feels like it right he's been hitting triples mm-hmm. i think he went uh i think he went four for five last night i want to yeah. say four for five with that huge game tying homer and say a suzuki being this good it feels to me, it's not like, you know, there was a month early in the season when Patrick Wisdom was like, is this guy going to make the all-star team? You know, and, right. and now he's on the bottom of the uh, of the uh, of the roster. And I think he's a fine bottom of the roster kind of guy, uh, P.S. But this is this is to me with his success in Japan, with his success in stretch, as we saw last year, could be something more resembling sustainable. And if Seiya Suzuki is comfortable and uh, reaching what his peak could be in the majors, mm-hmm. I think that raises the ceiling for what this team is now and for the next couple of years significantly, because that would that has the potential sure. to be the big bat that we've talked about the Cubs needing to trade for. Mm hmm. Yeah, the whole, uh, you know, it's it's like a trade because the person is playing so much better that they're a different version of themselves. But that is certainly <laughs> yes. true in this case. I, I do feel like that narrative is overused and just like lazy in terms of trying to explain away bad uh, GMing. But uh, yes, <laughs> yeah, it say has has been phenomenal since that break. And it actually makes me think of a moment that happened during those three games that has become, I would say, the the most used say a gif of the year which was there was like a foul ball he wanted the ball someone grabbed it from him and then he pretended to be a a big old baby and and was like fake crying until he (laughs) got the ball back 
And first of all, I think that just speaks to him having a good sense of humor. But at the time, I remember there being some like meatheads on Twitter who were like, yeah, the guy's hitting fucking 200 and he's goofing around on the bench. Like, mm-hmm. you should be more serious. Like, no, 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 my friends, you need to stay loose and you need to say, hey, I'm getting a little much need a break. I'm still happy to be here. I'm still sitting. I, I, I'm like leaning over the top of the dugout, which a lot of guys don't do when they're struggling. Yeah. And that I think speaks to like his character and his demeanor, not buying into like, oh, I guess I suck now and being like, yeah, I've had a rough go. Let's like reset, recalibrate. And now he's been good again. Absolutely. And I think that also, and I don't know directly how much David Ross had to do with communicating with Saya in that run, but I think for everything we've heard about David Ross dating back to his playing days as a lead leader, this might have been a case where of, of good managing where as long as he was open with Saya and letting him know you're going to be sitting for a couple of days, but I, you're coming back. Like, mm-hmm. I think just being open and communicating with a player clearly enough so that they know this isn't you're not banished that this is you are going to be coming back let's you gives you the the chance to really fully clear your head as opposed Mm -hmm. to just you know sitting and fretting for a few days which doesn't help anybody so i think this is i think david ross gets like i don't think he's an a plus manager when when they when he was hired and when joe madden was (laughs) you know uh not fired but not rehired whatever it was that thing I I was like, well, there's a David Ross being as good as Joe Madden one day would be him reaching his 95th to 99th percentile mm-hmm. uh, outcome. Uh, but I think he gets a weird amount of hate on uh, on Twitter, honestly. And I think this is an, an example where maybe this is something that we have to say he handled right with a, in a difficult situation with a guy who was a star was struggling. Um, I think he's he's managed say uh, well. Yeah, he definitely has. Um, and speaking of David Ross, I don't know if you saw the the piece of news that it was him who said to Rizzo, hey, I think you need to like, get this looked at again. The Crazy concussion. that it comes from someone who's not Yeah, someone who's not on the Yankees. This see the Yankees are such dog shit, like as an organization right now, and as Yankees fans will tell you every year since 2009, but certainly like this year and, and the last few, just nonsense, making nonsense moves on the field to some terrible stuff off the field and ha- their handling of Rizzo was incredible. Like not like earlier, you were saying this is it's easy to play the hindsight game. This isn't hindsight. Everyone saw what happened with T- Tatis at first how he you know was really shaken up and then couldn't hit a ball for like a full month month and a half after that before they sat him down and now Rizzo's being shut down for the year and yeah it was David Ross who said you got to get them to look at this again and uh just just embarrassing indefensible stuff from the Yankees organization in uh, really they and they might only be taking the bronze for embarrassing organizations this year I was thinking about it the other day but like I, I don't know if I've seen more fully top to bottom embarrassing years, but like when you have the White Sox and the Angels battling it out for the way Jeez. they've handled stuff this year. Yeah. And then like that's not even mentioning the A's and the Royals who are historically bad, but like not just being bad at baseball, but yeah. the White Sox had a fucking shooting in the in the, in the stadium. Yeah. I'm sure Fox and, News had a field day with that. Um, oh, my God. Yes. But. Right. Well, and, and all of those things don't even mention the Orioles banishing their broadcaster for nothing, basically. For mentioning a stat that was real. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, yeah. It's, it's been uh, an, such an embarrassing year for so many teams, but you can throw the Yankees in there, and I think their handling of Anthony Rizzo is, like, the worst of it all. Oh, I'm, but, I'm thrilled thrilled to see the Yankees uh, being an absolute trash. And you can tell, I mean, being at the stadium last night, like, it is – there's no no energy there at all. It is it was it was pretty it was definitely like a 30 percent capacity crowd. Yeah. Um, but the to your point, the the sense of entitlement amongst Yankees fans, just a bunch of, you know, 12 year olds holding up signs like just one before I die. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. You, you just won. <laughs> that, that is very funny. <laughs> just the tiniest child you can find. Like, please, sir. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, that, that's, uh, that's all the baseball notes I had for us today, Adam. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you get anything, any other, uh, hot topics before we close up shop here. No, no. And, and this, uh, this part of the podcast brought to you by Hot Topic. Go to hey! your local mall and, uh, 
Buy some shirts that make other people feel uncomfortable. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> and yourself, probably. <laughs> so just looking ahead here at the uh, the upcoming schedule, Cubs have one more against San Francisco today. That's Wicks uh, going for the Cubbies. And then they have a four-game set at home against the uh, the D-backs. The pitching, uh, pitching rotation for that will be Assad on Thursday. Then you got Tyone on Friday, who I guess the best thing you can say for Tyone when you look at Sunday is like at least he gave the Cubs almost six innings, but mm-hmm. you're still not going to feel great about giving up, what was it, four runs, five runs? Yeah, yeah, it was Yeah, it was either four or five. But he, I feel like Tyone's had, uh, he's had a lot of, sit- a good number of situations this year uh, where he gives up a lot early and then grinds mm-hmm. it out. So at the end, it looks okay. And then I guess in the Tigers game, he did the opposite, right? Where he looked right. great until the very end yeah, and gave yeah, up yeah. a grand slam. Yeah. Uh, when you give up just a shit ton of runs <laughs> in your year, I guess you're going to have a lot of both. But um, yeah, he. I, I, I think it's understandable to have the meltdowns we see online when Tyone ever gives up a run where they're like, banish him to hell, exile <laughs> yeah. him, send him, a, DFA him with three more years on his contract. And I think that's all goofy. But right. uh, but I mean, besides that little stretch of good games in the middle. Yeah, he's been bad this year. It's uh, that's one of our one of our calls from preseason. Why we were like, Senga got this what, and Tyone got more than Senga. What's happening here? That call right. looks good right now, but, um, you know, but you need five starters and he is, he's functionally your fifth right now. Right. Oh yeah, for sure. I think, uh, I think at this, at this moment, it's hard to not see a playoff rotation that is steel, certainly steel number one, and then probably Hendricks Assad as your, as your numbers two and three. Now, in terms of, I don't expect Wicks to really be in that mix, but is it, is it even possible if he got called up in September? How does that work? I think it, I, know uh, I should you, know this. Yeah, uh, so usually, I I don't know if the rules have changed since the rules around uh, rosters have changed. It used to be you had to be on the roster by September 1 to Mm -hmm. be uh, eligible for the playoffs. So I'm not, uh, I guess I'm not 100% sure on how that lines up. But, you know, it's it's sort of shaping up where if he is eligible, it's, you would think it would be possible, you know, the way he's pitching. I mean, it's, and Marcus Stroman, by the way, just a small bit of news about him. He was, uh, he threw, I think it was 35 pitches in a simulated game in Arizona and came off the mound clapping, looking good. Everyone seemed into it. So who knows? There's a chance he could uh, sneak back in at the end. here too. Yeah. And then it sounds like Boxberger and Fulmer are still working their ways back. So we'll see how that impacts, uh, impacts things. How, How do you expect Luke Little to be used? I think if you, I mean, probably planning for three or four outs at a time from him. Um, he d- sort of pitched on back to back nights for the first time in in his career uh, in mm-hmm. the last couple weeks in Iowa and seemed like he bounced back okay. So I think if you're in a situation where it's middle, middle innings, probably you're bringing a reliever in and two of the three guys lined up next are left handers. I think that's primarily yeah. where you're going to see him matched up with lefties, short inning bursts, I think. Um, but I'm excited to see it. He's he's a big lefty with stuff, and it's uh, it's going to be fun. Yeah. Um, so anyway, one more against San Francisco today. It'd be great to get the sweep, um, mm-hmm. obviously. Then four against Arizona. I have not even heard of half of these pitchers for Arizona. It doesn't mean <laughs> they're not good. But like the, the, last, the last guy pitching uh, against Hendricks on Sunday, it, uh, tell me how you think this would be pronounced. It's okay. called P... P F A A D T. Fat. Fat? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I Have think you ever heard of this person? I know, but I ha- I've seen it written down. But I, I so in that sense. Fat. Yeah. Fat. fat. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It feels I, like a subtitle for like a, some sort of noise a person would make. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's sort of, it is. <clears throat> Is that like, yeah, is that just right. like, <laughs> that's Basically. Uh, Brandon, and because of this, he's going to throw, he's going to throw a perfect game. Oh uh, yeah. hundred percent. So congratulations, uh, BF. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, but yeah, so then four against the diamondbacks who are right in the thick of things in the, uh, in the wild card would be nice to crush their spirits and then mm-hmm. off on a, uh, on a road trip against the, the Rockies and then the diamondbacks again. So the Rockies, like, despite the fact that they suck, I feel like you can't ever take games at Coors for granted. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, hopefully, hopefully that will be a, a, a constructive week here. And then I guess the only other thing I got is uh, Bears Packers on Sunday. Who you got? 
Oh man, I have I have to I have to think the Bears are going to win it because if they don't, if they lose the opener against uh, newbie Jordan Love, newbie four year veteran uh, mm-hmm. Jordan Jordan Love, uh, it's going to be a depressing a depressing beginning <laughs> after all the hype this off season. So I I think they I actually think the Bears will win. Um, yeah, how about you? What's your vibe? Yeah, I I mean I I same as you. I think I think it would be very very upsetting if they if they don't. But uh, always 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 one of my favorite days of the year. You got a Cubs Cubs day game, Bears at four o'clock, men's U.S. Open final. I mean, come on. Oh, it's gonna be a great Sunday. Yeah, it's, it's gonna, a, be, gonna be a great time. Sunday. Let's have a good Wednesday. Thanks for listening, everybody. Add away game spot on all the things. Rate and review if you haven't, and we'll uh, we'll catch you next week. Bear down. Bear down.